All right, working. All right, so welcome everyone to our November Diabetes Journal Club. And we're having Leo Martinez, who's um, an epidemiologist and newly started off this year as an assistant professor in Boston University's Department of Epidemiology. And he uses epidemiological and quantitative approaches to study those early life risk factors for pediatric tuberculosis in high burden settings um, and tuberculosis transmission dynamics in high risk populations, for example, incarcerated people, persons with living with HIV and diabetes, and the relationship between tuberculosis and non communicable diseases such as diabetes. And he'd mentioned to us that generally his audience is tuberculosis epidemiologist. So this is kind of a new thing presenting to a more diabetes focused audience. So we're looking forward to hearing from you, Leo. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. okay. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so thanks for the introduction. And um, so my name is Leo Martinez. I'm at Boston University and I'm um, going to talk today about some work that um, I've done investigating glycemic trajectories among newly diagnosed TB patients. This is work in collaboration with a large group um, in Jiangsu province, China, that I'm going to talk about a little bit later. And if there are any questions, um, you, can, you can either ask me at the end or interrupt me, I'm really flexible. So in the TB field, it's fairly well known that people living with diabetes have increased risk of TB disease, increased risk of poor treatment outcomes, um, and, and other TB related outcomes. And so these are results from a recent meta-analysis which found that people living with diabetes had an increased risk of treatment failure or death um, compared to persons without diabetes. They also had a, a greater risk of relapse. So if they were cured of their TB, they, they were much more likely to develop TB again. And they also had a twofold increased risk of two month culture conversion. So um, basically, again, another marker for treatment failure. Um, when they're after they're diagnosed with TB. And so this relationship between diabetes and poor treatment outcomes is generally well characterized um, in the TB field. And there's been a lot of discussion in the field about whether people living with diabetes should have um, longer treatment regimens if they're diagnosed with TB or a higher dose regimen potentially. Um, but what's a little bit less explored are TB patients that are not diagnosed with diabetes, but they may have some um, stress hyperglycemic event after being diagnosed with TB. So that's, that's a little bit what I'm gonna talk about today. And um, stress hyperglycemia has been previously reported among TB patients. Um, they often have abnormal glycemic measurements after being diagnosed, um, but there's, uh, there's really a lack of clarity about what this really means and, um, and the different glycemic trajectories that patients um, have. Um, also the clinical implications for stress hyperglycemia in TB patients is not very clear. It hasn't been really well studied, um, but it's been, there's been a lot of hypotheses about different trajectories that may be taking place and also um, what this could mean. So this is one paper in 2018 that hypothesized some different trajectories that um, could occur after a TB diagnosis. So you can see here on the x-axis is timing of a TB diagnosis and on the y-axis is the degree of hyperglycemia. So you can see um, some, you know, there's hypotheses that maybe hyperglycemia goes up after diagnosis or maybe it goes up only after TB treatment. Um, we don't really know what's causing these abnormal measurements. So it could be treatment or diagnosis or infection. Um, and then there's also some stable, more stable um, trajectories. Um, and all this is pretty hypothetical and there hasn't been a, a study that's really looked at this. So 
Um, so my collaborators and I tried to understand this a bit better and tried to study this over the past um, three to four years. And so we had two main aims. Um, the first one was to identify distinct glycemic trajectories among new TB patients. And the second was to try to understand what are the clinical implications of that. So do these um, patients that have distinct trajectories, do they have differential um, poor treatment outcomes after, after that? So um, either compared to a normal glycemic trajectory or compared to people with diabetes. So I'm gonna go into a little more detail here, but here's, um, um, so here's the group that I collaborate with. I've been collaborating with this group from Jiangsu province, China since 2013. Um, this is really a long held collaboration between Jiangsu Provincial CDC um, and Nanjing Medical University and, and myself. Um, and Jiangsu province is, is pretty urban. So it's around 80 million people. So fairly big, um, really large cities. And a major problem in the province, health problem, is diabetes. Um, the diabetes prevalence is um, eight to ten percent, but in that's diagnosed diabetes. In reality, it's probably closer to twelve to thirteen percent, so pretty high. Um, and so this really represents millions of diabetes um, patients. And this is, um, you know, diabetes is an important risk factor for TB. And so a lot of the TB control. Um, field that I work with is really interested in this interaction between these two diseases. So from March 2018 to 2019, um, we recruited a cohort of diagnosed TB patients from two TB specific hospitals. Um, the only exclusions were if a patient had previous TB or if they had drug resistance um, against TB. Uh, the, re the treatment regimen for drug resistance is really a lot longer than for drug susceptible TB. It's, sometimes it's up to 20 months um, compared to six months for drug susceptible TB. So their, their trajectory may be very, very different to study. Um, and so we, we wanted to exclude them for now um, in this study. But other than that, we recruited, um, we consecutively recruited patients as long as they consented from these two hospitals. Leo, can I ask a question? Yeah, for sure. If you just go back to the previous slide. So you're looking at basically uh, different glycemic trajectories and there wasn't exclusion based on previously diagnosed diabetes or anything like that. It was specifically no. newly yeah. diagnosed TB cases. Yeah, only TB cases. So we, yeah. um, one group that we had um, that we looked at were previously, previously diagnosed diabetes. And we wanted to compare that group with these other groups that didn't have diabetes, that, but they may have a stress right. hyperglycemic event. Yeah. And then for the drug resistant, um, I guess like rifampicin resistant tuberculosis cases, yeah. do you have reason to think that this, like these specific types of treatments, not only are they like longer as a concern for your study, but also that maybe there's different glycemic trajectories that are, you know, looks yeah, and exactly. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. I think our concern was that, well, we had multiple concerns. I think one is recruiting enough multi-drug resistant TB cases for it to be meaningful to study. I think we would have had to recruit a lot to have enough drug resistant cases um, because drug resistance is maybe five to 10% of all TB cases in this province. Um, but the other concern was that if TB treatment is causing these stress hyperglycemic events and you have a three times or more longer treatment regimen they may be much more likely to, you know, I think the trajectory would be much different. Um, and we wanted to keep the treatment regimen for TB consistent so we could, we didn't have that. But I, I think it's a really important question that probably a future study needs to look at. Um, but it's a bit more difficult to design and probably costs a lot more. Um, no, so that was sense. one. Yeah, yeah but it's a great question. Um, and so we, we um, collected or we conducted fasting plasma glucose tests at five time points. Um, so, and we wanted to really get the spectrum of um, 
throughout this time period. So we collected at diagnosis, three months during treatment, six months during treatment. So this is the end of treatment and then two months post-treatment and four months post-treatment. So we wanted to understand, you know, if someone's um, glycemic levels increased during treatment, did it decrease after, after they got off treatment? Um, and we, participants were included if they had at a minimum these first three um, fasting plasma glucose tests. Um, one of our primary aims was to create these glycemic trajectories. And so we, we felt we needed at least these three to be able to do that. Um, I think we were a little bit unclear about how retention would be um, after treatment ended. We were a little bit um, concerned that a lot of participants wouldn't want to keep being followed up. They weren't in the, in the TB hospital anymore. They may not want to um, keep, uh, keep on the study. So I think that was one of our concerns. So, um, but actually um, you're gonna see it, it, it ended up being okay. <laughs> and our study outcomes were treatment failure or death, or one of, this was um, to look at the second aim of our study. Um, this is a composite, so poor treatment outcomes is a composite outcome of treatment failure or death. And treatment failure is defined as a smear or culture positive test recorded in the final two months of treatment. Um, so the, often a, a patient will be diagnosed with TB and they'll be culture or smear positive. And then as they go on treatment, they'll turn to culture negative or smear negative. Um, but they may go back to positive again if treatment fails. Um, and that means um, uh, they, they, they fail treatment basically. And so our other outcome was, um, or other part of our composite outcome was death from any cause during the course of TB treatment. And we were, um, we tried to really be blinded to these outcomes, um, to treatment outcomes when we were constructing our glycemic trajectory. So we had, we actually had two databases, one with outcomes and one with glycemic measurements, just so that we weren't biased in any way, analytically at least. And so we recruited 626 patients um, of which 63 were excluded because of a previous TB diagnosis or drug-resistant TB. Another 63 were excluded because they had less than three fasting plasma glucose tests or they had insufficient treatment outcome data. And so 500 total patients were included. Um, 95 had the first three fasting plasma glucose tests and then 405 had all five time points. Um, and so you can see that here at the end of the flow chart. Um, and 45 of these 500 patients had an unfavorable treatment event. Um, so they either failed treatment or, um, or they died during treatment um, or at the end of treatment. So, and so before I show you the different glycemic trajectories, um, I want to show you those from um, participants with and without diabetes, just to show you a little bit of the heterogeneity here. Um, so on the left, you can see persons without diabetes. This is 425 of the 500 on the right persons with diabetes. Um, so diabetes prevalence in this TB population was 15%. Um, and you can see each line in these figures is one individual in the study and you can follow their individual trajectory throughout this, this time period. Um, and on the y-axis, you can see this is the fasting plasma glucose level. So obviously much higher levels on the right-hand side, as you would expect, um, but some high values on the left as well. Um, and clearly some heterogeneity there between patients on both sides, to be honest. Um, and so I'm gonna dig a little deeper uh, into this, especially into this group but we're also gonna look at this group in more detail too. Um, and so I think um, I'm gonna look at each group that we classified separately, just so you can get a little bit of a closer look. So we classified a, a normal glycemic trajectory group. I think one thing that I wanna quickly mention is there are no, there's no template for, we couldn't like follow um, some other study that had done this before. Um, and so we're kind of 
um, uh, trying to figure it out. Um, usually, you know, we do research and we follow a little bit of what others have done. And so this is a little bit more difficult because some of these trajectories have not been defined before. So we wanted to, so I think future studies are gonna have to look at this and nail this down a little bit further. Um, but we wanted a normal glycemic trajectory, which we defined as four more glycemic tests below 6.1 mmol per liter. Um, and you can see here, um, you can see that these patients have a consistently normal trajectory. There is a little bit of um, elevated risk among one or two patients, but then they, they went back down to normal levels. Um, and this represented around one third of our cohort. Oops. Um, this is uh, persons living with diabetes. Um, and you can see, do you have a question? I see your hand. Yeah, didn't want to okay. interrupt too much. No, 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 um, it's okay. But you had mentioned that you kind of didn't have a precedent for this type of study on different trajectories. I think there were five different ones, basically, yeah. including the diabetes one. Um, but you mentioned kind of in your introduction that there were previous studies looking at some glycemic trajectories, but defining things based on, I think, HbA1c or hemoglobin yeah. A1c. Can you talk about the reasoning for why you chose yeah. to go by fasting plasma glucose? Yeah, great question. I think, um, so the previous studies were actually, I'll just go back to that really quick. These were hypothetical. So this is actually not a real, it's not real data. This is like a review paper where they were like, this is what we think it may be. This is what we think it may be. And we need, we need some um, data to inform this. But I, I think that's um, is a really good question because we actually wanted, we actually didn't want to use HbA1c for a specific reason is that, and, and maybe people here have more thoughts, but um, from what I understand it, it uses uh, a mean over a two to three month period um, of your sh uh, blood sugar levels. And so um, this would potentially cloud a little bit of the heterogeneity that we were trying to see because you're averaging over a time period. And we actually didn't want an average, we wanted you know, to measure these acute events. Um, and so, so that's kind of the reason why we, we, we didn't wanna do HbA1Cs. Um, I think that would have been really interesting if we had multiple tests, just because um, of the different sensitivity uh, among these different tests and, and potentially using fasting plasma glucose could cause other issues. Um, but, but that's kind of the reason why we, we chose that. Because if we have an average over a two to three month period, and then we have another test at, you know, we have this zero, and then we have a three month, it's a bit difficult to know, um, to understand the heterogeneity there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thanks for yeah. explaining that. Yeah, and of I course. Think maybe Camille, if you wanted to add okay. something. Yeah, so can I just follow up on that? So if you go back to the graphic HbA1c, so what stood out to me was, it looks like the problem seems to be with people with pre-diabetes or at least diabetes. Because if you look at if you look at the green, I mean the green line, it starts around 5.5%, 5.6, which is usually the cutoff for pre-diabetes. Yeah. And when you look at the red line, they don't really seem to be that, I mean, that spike as in the blue one, the green line. So looking at this graph, I would have imagined like, okay, the problem should maybe you're expecting to see this glycemic stress in people with pre-diabetes and not people with normal glycemia. So yeah. I would imagine kind of a selection and inclusion criteria based on diabetes status. Yeah, yeah, we, we didn't have a selection. We didn't like exclude diabetes patients or, or um, non, you know, we wanted to understand, um, uh, we had a group that had diabetes. This, this graph, I, I do think I agree that maybe there's a pre-diabetes group in here that is part of these elevated groups, uh, potentially, um, and they could be overlapping with some of the elevation here. Um, and uh, that would be interesting. I mean, I think I'm going to show you the different trajectories from our study, and maybe we can come back to this slide and look at the differences there. But potentially the, the ones that have stress hyperglycemia, you could hypothesize have prediabetes or some sort of early stage diabetes potentially. 
Um, and that's one of the hypotheses that um, we talked about at the end kind of, of the slide. But, but I, think, I think it's a really good point. It's tough to know exactly what these stress hyperglycemic events mean, and maybe it's a pre-diabetes um, state in a sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I mean, I would have thought like fasting glucose is also the, a little bit like the least sensitive. I would have thought like two hours glucose would be a bit more reliable because can, yeah, yeah, compared to just one random, I mean, one fasting blood glucose, which could have been affected by many things, sleep and all the other, yeah. yeah. No, for sure. Yeah, we talked about using two hour um, blood glucose also. Um, it's not commonly used in this area with, by this group. So I think that was part of the reason, but I think ideally we would have used that. I agree. Ideally we would have used multiple tests um, and compared across. I think, uh, I think we basically ran out of money where we couldn't use all three tests for hey, five different real. time periods. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I but think I think it um, plays into a bigger discussion about the different measures that are used like the oral glucose tolerance test and or the hba1c in diagnosis in general and that's really yeah. contentious in diabetes so i'm yeah, sure yeah. yeah no for sure yeah that's why I, yeah it would have been better to use multiple just to like maybe that some of the heterogeneity there is test specific um so i definitely agree yeah um let me go back here um so this is um, persons living with diabetes. This is another group. Um, and we, um, we define this group as so previously diagnosed diabetes, either medical records or physician diagnosis um, that we found in the study recruitment, during the study recruitment. Um, and then we, uh, again, it, it's a bit difficult to know. Um, there's no and maybe people here have a better idea, but it's a bit difficult to know if you have five fasting plasma glucose tests, what is the definition of an undiagnosed diabetes patient um, in this specific TB population? Um, there was no guidelines that we could look at to understand that completely. Um, and this is actually, we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, but it's actually important um, maybe clinically from a clinical perspective, um, you know, I think the group that I work with in China, they, we had multiple discussions about what changes should they make? Should they, should they diagnose some of these patients as having diabetes or not, or are they just having this stress event? And then it goes back to normal. So we in the study defined an undiagnosed diabetes patient as um, a patient that maintained test results above 7.0 mmol per liter four more times during the duration of the study. So we thought this really represented consistent, um, uh, consistently high um, glycemia, hyperglycemia, and um, and not uh, an acute an acute event. Um, but you know, I think there's not an easy answer there, at least that I could find. So one uh, question, Leo. So about yeah ascertainment of uh, diabetes cases. So did you have, so you talked about checking the medical records. So did yeah. you consider patients who could be on treatment? I mean, without- Yeah, so sorry, we did include that. Yeah, if they were taking um, uh, diabetes specific medication, um, we also included that. Um, and that, that was also in medical records as well. So, yeah. Um, so this is a uh, different, um, glycemic trajectory group that we defined. So this is transient hyperglycemia. This has been a bit more discussed in, at least in the TB literature um, as a potential state that needs more, um, needs to be looked at more. So basically um, how it's described is an acute hyperglycemic event that um, followed by a reduction to normal levels after TB treatment. And you can see that um, you can see that happening with a lot of these patients here. This was about 20% of the cohort. So not like an insignificant amount, but basically um, all of these patients have pretty, um, pretty acute um, hyperglycemic events, but then they drop back down um, to normal levels after treatment, um, either at the eighth or the 10th month of follow-up. Um, again, this, th there may be something happening here because we're using fasting plasma glucose. There may be some uh, you know, um, test specific thing happening, but 
it's, you know, and that, that would be interesting to talk about. So this was also, an, there was also some states that some participants where we didn't, we weren't sure how to define. There was this state of, of some participants that had really unstable um, glycemic measurements, and they were really bouncing around all over the place throughout follow-up. Um, you know, I think this, we, we weren't sure exactly. Um, I know in the diabetes literature, there's this um, state of glycemic variability or glycemic instability that, um, I mean, I read a lot of papers on it. I'm not an expert or anything, but um, this, this is, to some extent, this is what potentially this could describe is just a lot of bouncing around in these glycemic states. And so we define this as two or more alterations in glycemic status um, from the start of treatment to the end of follow-up. So they would go from maybe normal to diabetes to pre-diabetes back to normal or, or start in diabetes and then go to normal and pre-diabetes. And so really a bit unstable. And then this was a, um, another state, a, a minority of participants where they were consistently hyperglycemic, but we weren't sure if we could define them as having diabetes. So they had four or more tests that were above 6.1 mmol per liter from the start of treatment to the end of follow-up but they weren't consistently above seven MOL per liter. Uh, maybe they would have one out of the five tests or two, uh, potentially two out of the five tests above seven. Um, actually, I think if they had two, then we didn't do this, um, but um, they weren't consistently above seven. And so we weren't sure um, how to define them exactly. So um, this is not like the, the easiest title of a trajectory to name, but we thought it was it best described this group, so. Um, so we had these five trajectories that we looked at um, and that we classified, at least in this study. Um, but next, we wanted to try to assess whether these patients had um, abnormal clinical outcomes, um, at least for their um, TB diagnosis and TB treatment. So that's what we looked at next. And for the most part, these, these groups did have really high or poor treatment outcomes for TB. Um, so specifically the transient hyperglycemia group and the glycemic instability group um, represented 50% of all unfavorable treatment outcomes. Um, and then adding in diabetes, these three groups represented 80% of all unfavorable treatment outcomes. So most treatment outcomes in these groups. Um, I'm going to walk you through some of the regression analyses that we did. These are um, multivariable regression analyses adjusting for uh, a range of characteristics. We're going to get to the glycemic trajectory groups because that's the main aim, but just to show you a few other variables so you can understand our data a little bit better. Um, here you can see adjusted odds ratios of poor treatment outcomes among persons living with and without diabetes. And this was um, the first few slides of this presentation I showed. There's like a meta-analysis that had done this and we found relatively similar results. Um, and we also found that glycemic control um, modified this relationship for the most part. So um, persons living with diabetes that had poor glycemic control had um, especially poor treatment outcomes um, in, our, in our cohort. And those with quote unquote good glycemic control had um, fairly similar treatment outcomes compared to those without diabetes. So this has been, um, this is, uh, I don't know, fairly logical, I think, um, but it's important to show in our data, I think. Then we also found that metformin use modified this, um, this risk of poor treatment outcomes. And this has been shown in a couple studies, but again, um, it'd be interesting to talk about if anyone has thoughts, but those that use metformin had similar risk of poor treatment outcomes compared to those without diabetes, but those that did not use metformin used some other anti-diabetes um, medications had um, higher risk. So some modification by um, drug use and also by glycemic control. And some of this may be, you know, measuring similar things, right? Maybe those that had metformin had good glycemic control and, or, um, and so that, that could potentially be happening. Um, lastly, we found that patients with 
um, abnormal glycemic trajectories. So those that had some sort of stress hyperglycemic event had increased risk of poor treatment outcomes. Um, it's a bit um, tight in there um, to read, but I'm gonna walk you through it. Um, this is all compared to a normal glycemic trajectory group. So those that were consistently low. Um, so TB patients with transient hyperglycemia had a 4.2 times higher um, odds of a poor treatment outcome. Um, those that had instable glycemic stability, so the last line, were six times higher risk of a poor treatment outcome compared to those with a normal glycemic trajectory. And this is all compared, uh, maybe a good um, group to look at here is the persons with diabetes, because we, we know that group really well. Um, and these other trajectories, we, maybe these groups we don't know as well. But this group had a 6.6 .6 times higher risk compared to a normal glycemic trajectory. So, and this is adjust, adjusted for some of the other characteristics that are related to poor treatment outcomes. Um, and so this is suggestive that these groups may be at higher risk um, for poor TB treatment outcomes. Um, but, and then the last group that was consistently hyperglycemic, but not, we couldn't really classify them as having diabetes, um, had a non-significantly higher risk, but there's pretty low sample size. I don't think we can say anything super confidently at all. Um, hey, Leo, um, yeah. could you just give us a bit of background? If you go to the yeah. previous slide, um, this one here? sputum smear status and then the lung cavitation yeah. at baseline as um, things adjusted for. Could you talk especially about that last one? Yeah, for sure. So. Um, one of the risk, one of the big risk factors for poor treatment outcomes is how severe your TB is basically when you're diagnosed. And so one of the ways to know that is, um, how, if you have lung cavitations basically. So, um, I guess one way to think about it is, you know, if you're diagnosed really, if you've had TB for a bit of time and you're diagnosed late, let's say, or, um, you, you're not diagnosed early on in your disease process, you may um, develop lung, lung cavitations and, and sometimes uh, multiple. So, um, and uh, treatment works less well if you have really severe disease logically. So um, in a sense, you're sort of adjusting for severity of TB in a sense. So you're sort of adjusting for that severity. Um, so we, um, it's possible what could be happening is, and this is something we were talking about uh, a bit, is maybe the severity of TB is, is causing some of this, some of these stress hyperglycemic events as well. Maybe that's some of the interaction here. Um, it's, it's, it was a bit difficult to um, pin that down exactly. Um, you know, understand we weren't, we didn't have like the sample size to look at that specifically. I think one of the things we would like to do after the study is to do a bit of a larger study to understand these groups a bit better. Um, because, um, because, you know, if you stratify out your groups by five times, you, you get a little bit smaller. And so you can't look at some of these really important details, I feel like. Um, I was gonna say something else about that. Um, about lung cavitation. Maybe it'll come back. Maybe yeah, it'll come back. feel free to okay. return to it. I think Camille okay. might have had a question. Yeah. yeah. So one quick question is, uh, so I remember in med school, one of the primary reasons for, for TB failure was lack of treatment compliance. So did you monitor mm -hmm. at all or did you control for treatment compliance? Yeah, we didn't, um, we didn't monitor that. Um, I think everyone completed treatment. I don't know how well they took. I don't think we had measurement on compliance. I think potentially that could have been um, impacting treatment failure rates. That's one of the primary reasons for yeah. treatment because it's so. So if I remember my experience in Cameroon, so they have about four tablets to take every morning at five a.m. I don't know about the case in China. So it's quite a stressful and. Yeah, it is. It's an inconvenient for patients. So one of the primary reasons to see this, to have a positive sputum smear at uh, two months and repeatedly is usually lack of compliance, which is a good problem. Yeah, no, definitely. I think that is, um, 
you know, definitely, I think that is something that could be impacting the treatment failure rates um, in all studies that look at this outcome. Potentially, yeah, it's interesting to think about how that would affect your glycemic measurements. Maybe that mod could modify your glycemic measurements, potentially your compliance rate. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that would modify it or not. Um, but it definitely would modify your outcome, the treatment failure, for sure. Yeah. Um, so if you go one slide back, maybe the yeah. metformin and no metformin. So I think this was yeah. quite interesting because uh, so if you look at the confidence interval for no metformin use is quite wide. And I think this yeah. is surprising because the sample size in the no metformin is, is very small. So metformin in diabetes, as we all know, is the first line treatment in patients with diabetes. So yeah. to find patients who are not on metformin, I, I think it's quite difficult. Most would be on two or three, but you do have metformin. You do have metformin as the primary treatment. So... I think this could be a bit misleading. I mean, I do think. Yeah. Like in, in what way? Based on the sample size, you're saying? Yeah, based on the sample size and based on yeah. that patients who are not on metformin could be really, I mean, I really don't imagine because most patients, I mean, would be on metformin unless patients are typically on, um, on insulin alone. So I would imagine maybe this group of patients are, I don't know, hospitalized patients or patients who are severely yeah. and, they need to only be on insulin. Yeah, it could be. There could yeah. be something happening there. All these patients are hospitalized, so they're all similar um, okay. in terms of uh, they're all in the hospital, most because of their TB. Um, and so they're all hospitalized. And that's actually, that's where the study occurred. Um, but, but I do think there are issues with um, sample size with some of this, um, for sure. Um, yeah, so apart from the sample size, I think it tells us about the type of patients because yeah, it could be patient not to be on metformin. As yeah, be there could be, problem. yeah. I guess you're saying that if they're not on metformin, there's some selective reason for that. Exactly. And that could be causing treatment yeah. failure more. Yeah. It could be, yeah. It could for be sure. due to liver. It could be due to, I don't know, liver failure really the, uh, <laughs> at, the, at the severe stage of liver disease. It could be. So it, I think, yeah. For sure. of the diabetes. So. Yeah, no, I think it could be. It could be uh, uh, basically a marker for severity, yeah. um, which is kind of what this is saying here. Um, so it could be basically these are saying very similar things, these two groups, um, in a sense, um, as a marker for severity. Um, but yeah, I completely agree. It's, it's difficult to, to take too much out of this, um, I, I think because I think it wasn't our main aim. And so we didn't like sam we didn't sample the population to, to power this exactly well. Um, but yeah, it's a really good point. Yeah, really good questions. Um, this is a bit of a complicated slide. Um, how are we doing time-wise? Are we okay? Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, we're doing good. Um, okay, good. We've, we've even discussed a bit during, so go ahead. Yeah, okay, good. So we also looked at potential overdiagnosis of diabetes in our cohorts. Um, as I spoke about a bit earlier, this is a bit difficult um, to look at. And I think one of the questions um, by the TB control people um, that I work with is, should we, should we put people that have abnormal glycemic measurements on diabetes treatment? Or should we diagnose them with diabetes? Or how should we uh, manage this, this group? Um, they, they, were, they were looking at our results and, and trying to find some, some um, change in their policy that they could, that they could give. And th there's not some easy answers. So, um, so I'm gonna go through um, our, basically look at our final classification of diabetes diagnosis, which was a previous diabetes diagnosis or whether they had consistently high hyper um, glycemic measurements. So um, that really suggested consistently that they, were, they had diabetes. And then I'm gonna compare that to if we diagnose diabetes at each time point only, if we only use that time point and how much overdiagnosis there would be of diabetes if we only use this time point compared to our final classification. It's tricky because there's no, uh, we don't know for sure, maybe unless we followed this group a, a lot longer after 
um, but I'm gonna show. So 15% of our population had, um, we classified as having diabetes. Um, most of this was previously diagnosed diabetes. So if we used glycemic measurements only at um, TB diagnosis only, um, the diabetes diagnosis would be close to 20%, um, so about a 5% higher, um, uh, uh, higher diagnosis rate. And the overdiagnosis uh, would be around 5%. That's in the, the brown. If we diagnose diabetes based on um, glycemic measurements during TB treatment, so these two bars here, the, um, the amount of diabetes diagnosis would be much higher. Um, if we did it three months into treatment, it would be 27% diabetes prevalence. If we use glycemic measurements at the end of treatment um, and put people that had a, um, a test that indicates diabetes, they would be, it would be a 20%. So again, 5% higher. A lot of this is probably these transient hyperglycemic um, participants that we looked at. They're just going really high and then they're, they're dropping later um, is likely what, what is happening here. Um, and then if, if we were to use glycemic measurements after treatment, there's still some regression here in the diabetes, the amount of diabetes diagnosis. Um, it doesn't reach this final classification that we had, but it, it, it um, is a bit closer than any other time point. Um, so it's, it's tough because we don't know the absolute truth, you know, um, but I think what it suggests is that um, if you believe this final classification that you need a consistent um, glycemic measurement over time, then there could potentially be a lot of overdiagnosis of diabetes um, if we were to just use one glycemic measurement during TB treatment. Um, but interested if anyone has thoughts. <laughs> Um, basically, I told my colleagues that um, it wasn't completely clear um, by the data and we need a bit more information, but that there could be potential for overdiagnosis is what we, we chatted about. So um, some strengths and weaknesses of this study. Um, one was that we tested at five time points um, before, during, and after diagnosis, and the population was generally pretty representative of um, persons diagnosed with diabetes, um, with some, some caveats, um, drug-resistant TB was missing and persons with previous TB were missing, those two groups, but otherwise fairly representative. Um, but a lot of uh, limitations as well, and, and we've talked about some of these, um, and I think they're really important. So sample size, especially when you start grouping um, a lot in these different groups, I think sample size becomes a big issue here. Um, and we, we, what we want to do um, is to try to expand this study a bit bigger and to have a larger group of TB patients. This, in a sense, was our first uh, attempt to study this problem. And so now with this information, hopefully we can do a bit of a larger study. Um, so we tested for hyperglycemia through fasting plasma glucose. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, I think um, what would have been better is to use multiple tests, I think, because no real test is perfect, especially for this research question. Um, and so it would have been nice to try to account for some of that, that test variability as well. Um, so I think that that could be really um, interesting for the future. Um, we also talked about other potential um, confounders or modifiers of this relationship. Um, we didn't test for HIV, it, it, you know, which may be a risk factor for stress hyperglycemia. It may also be a risk factor for treatment failure, actually, as well. Um, and, uh, but HIV prevalence is, is super low in this setting um, in China. I think it's below 0.5% of TB patients. So there's really, um, it, it really wasn't um, relevant to this, to this specific um, area. I think if we were to do the study in, in some area where HIV prevalence was much higher, we would really need to record HIV. Um, statin use is another characteristic we didn't record. Um, it's been shown to be related to treatment outcomes for TB patients, also for um, 
you know, I don't know how it affects glycemic trajectories, um, but potentially that would have been nice to, to measure. And then we did not assess for adherence to fasting. So we, we scheduled morning visits and, and rescheduled visits if people didn't fast, but it, it's a bit difficult to um, really account for with, with your patient population other than, other than querying and, and asking and, and um, we can't be there um, at all times. So it, it was a bit tricky. So I think potentially this could also cause some uh, variability with fasting plasma glucose tests potentially if, if, if fasting wasn't strongly adhered to. Um, and I've talked about some of these, so maybe I can uh, skip these a little bit, but I think this is what the TB program asks is, what should we now do with a TB patient that has stress hyperglycemia? Um, it's not really clear. And I think probably we need some longer term follow-up data. I, I think at least in terms of their TB treatment, they should be watched more closely and, and for treatment failure, because this study suggests they may be at higher risk for treatment failure. But long term, it's not really clear what these groups represent in terms of their um, diabetes risk, in terms of their risk of getting TB again. Um, and so there, there, there's not a lot of clear answers there. Um, I think one hypothesis that I've heard is that potentially these groups represent an early stage type um, diabetes, kind of like a pre-diabetes, as, as you were saying, Camille, I think that is one hypothesis that could be. But I think for that, we need longer term follow-up and to follow up these patients to understand if, if they have higher risk of diabetes later. Um, oops, sorry about that. And then I think probably this group is gonna do more fasting plasma glucose testing on TB patients generally. Um, we wanna know how um, important this, this problem is, and we want a bigger sample um, to study this better. So I think they want to do further studies. They haven't started yet, but um, that's what we want to do. So, so some, just some general um, conclusions that this study suggests that newly diagnosed TB patients with transient hyperglycemia may be at high risk of TB treatment failure. And understanding the mechanisms for this is really um, potentially important um, you know, the, and what these groups exactly mean. The, do these groups just represent, um, uh, you know, represent groups that have risk factors for treatment failure anyways, and, and this is causing this, or are these, um, what do these stress hyperglycemic events really mean um, for these TB patients? And potentially could help with risk stratified approaches to anti-TB treatment. So, um, how can we adjust TB treatment based on this information? And I think we don't have enough data yet, but hopefully later. Um, so I work with this really big team. This is actually not the full team, but some of these people uh, in China and um, they're uh, really, really amazing group to work with and, and really motivated. Um, this Chao Liu um, with uh, her son here, this is the one of the leaders of this project. Li Mei Zhu is the, um, senior PI on a lot of this work. And um, this is the rest of the team here. So thanks um, for the invite. Um, and I am, that's the end of my presentation. Um, Thank you so much. Do you have any more questions? Yeah, I think thanks. It was amazing. Yeah. I think you just ended with a conclusion, and I was thinking the other way around. So you said, how can we modify CB treatment based on this? And all the way I have been thinking, how can we modify diabetes treatment? Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, okay. I mean, for patients who present transient hyperglycemia, maybe based on surgery or dialysis or anything that's going to happen, usually insulin is kind of the best option for them. So I was thinking, should all the patients diagnosed with CB with non-diabetes should they be switched to insulin? I mean, that, that was a question that was going through my mind. And you just said it the other way around, so. Yeah, yeah, it's funny um, how we think <laughs> based on, you know, yes, what yes. we always do every day. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think that's, I think part of this group from this work, we started working with the diabetes control in the province as well. Um, there's a, a large diabetes control group as well. 
and trying to trying to get at these questions also and, and answer these questions. It's it's tough because I think a lot of times these groups, the TB control group and the diabetes control group, work uh, separately, completely independently. Um, but for some of these issues that are um, you know mutually beneficial to look at or or where there's this interaction, I think it's really important to try to work together on those issues. So I think yeah, so I think completely agree with you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Leo. Um, Thanks, if anyone Lauren. has any questions, I know we have an endocrinologist here and someone studying diabetes genetics as well. So feel free to ask any questions throughout. Um, we have a few minutes left, um, but I just wanted to emphasize something that I, that I had seen in that review article that you had summarized a bit in that introduction, which was part of the challenge of understanding this syndemic of tuberculosis and diabetes or, or also hyperglycemia is just the fact that um, there is not only less uh, like relatively little sample size in a lot of studies but a lot yeah. of studies that are undertaken aren't cohort studies so you can't oftentimes see trajectories of a yeah. um, person's hyper hyperglycemia and also just understand, so does diabetes originate first or tuberculosis? And what I've continually heard is that um, just reading papers that diabetes predisposes you to developing active TB. Um, yeah, so, so a bunch of different thoughts there. I was wondering yeah. about that. No, 100%. I think I think often we design studies to have this exposure at baseline and we have an outcome in the future maybe, but actually it's really dynamic. You know, things go up and down and change and, and uh, different states change over time. And I think, especially when looking at these two diseases that I think they do change over time, it's really important to try to understand that, that dynamic. Um, and that um, it's tough though. I think it's, it, it makes it, it, it creates a, a little bit of a different complexity to it. Um, but I think it's really important for sure. Um, in terms of the directionality, I think this really important question as well. I think, um, I think there is evidence that, um, you know, a diabetes status may put you at higher risk for TB. And, and I think there's evidence for the other way around also. And so I think it's really important to, um, it, it's tough to understand completely, you know? And I think the, the mechanisms is, is really important to understand as well. I think potentially people, you guys probably have more, uh, know more about this than me about, you know, diabetes, um, you know, what it does to your immune system, what it does to, to everything that could potentially put you at higher risk for TB. But how it works the other way around is also really interesting to think about. Um, so, oh yeah, <laughs> um, there's a question there, but it's good. Um, so yeah, so I think this is really work that, I wouldn't say it's in its infancy in terms of understanding this relationship, but I think it's fairly new. And I think there's a lot of open questions that we don't really understand and how important this interaction is, is, is really important too. So it's, I think there's, that's why I am super interested in this topic and super interested in this interaction because there's just a lot we don't know and, and don't understand, so. Yeah, just to note, I think there's a couple kind of consortia, like the tandem consortium that yeah. focuses on this syndemic specifically, but it's something that I think needs a lot more investigation. So I was really curious to, to have you join the, the Global Diabetes Journal Club. And, and one thing I just wanted to note is that uh, you're a newly, uh, a newly minted assistant professor and yeah. looking for PhD students and postdocs. So if anyone watching this video or, or who's here knows of folks who, who would be interested in investigating that, um, that, that this could be a, a good thing to go into. Yeah, um, for sure. Definitely um, anyone can reach out for just to talk um, generally, um, not even just for that, just to talk. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, yeah, I know Tandem. I know the Tandem Consortium. I know those, that group, they're, they're really great. They, they have done a lot of work in this area too. And, um, but we need, I feel like we need consortium like that um, to try to understand this better. Um, yeah. Camille, did you want to add something? 
No, I think it's almost time. So just wanted to the recording. Yeah, yeah. All I'm right. glad I was good on time. <laughs> you were. Um, so we've heard from uh, both other folks here, very interesting topic and thanks for the presentation. And I like that you also added a note on just programmatic um, or health policy related considerations with this. I I'd be curious following your research on this topic to see more on, you know, recommendations for physicians who encounter patients with tuberculosis or physicians who encounter um, patients with diabetes who might develop active TB, you know, how, how things can be better managed. And I think it depends yeah. on the context, like you said. Um, so if you wanted to add anything that, that we've missed on discussion or, or emphasize anything, feel free, and then we can close off. Yeah, no, I think so. It's so important. I feel like, I feel like, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, it's so important to do these studies and bring new data and, and that's really, and, you know, publish and all that. But I think, you know, applying that data to make, uh, you know, informed changes um, to the program is, is really what I'm motivated by, actually, not even just the papers um, and the, you know, publication, you know. So I think, and I think I'm really lucky to be collaborating with both researchers in, in you know, um, academic institutions, but then also programmatic people, because I think, you know, often there's different priorities and I think both are really important and, you know, mixing that together is, is, is so important. So, um, yeah, I think it's really crucial. Um, so I, I think often, you know, data can't, one study can't necessarily change a, a program, program in general or, or change policy in general, but I think you know, working with them um, together over time is really, uh, at least in my experience, a good way to try to do that. So, yeah. All right. Thank you.